Hi there, and welcome to the Grief and Rebirth podcast. I'm your host, author and trauma survivor, Irene Weinberg, here to encourage you wherever you are in your healing journey. In each episode, I chat with incredible grief and trauma specialists, healers, mediums, and celebs, as well as remarkable people who have inspiring healing stories to share. If you're looking for a podcast that's both uplifting and inspiring, you've found it. Let us help you find your joy in life. Hi, everyone. I hope this finds each of you so very well. I'm speaking to you from my studio in West Orange, New Jersey, and I am absolutely delighted to have this opportunity to interview entrepreneur and author Bobby Gio DeSelli, whose book is titled Freedom from a Toxic Relationship with Food, a journey that will give you your life back. Bobby will be speaking to us from Grass Valley, California. Three personal events in Bobby's life served as a dramatic wake-up call, prompting her to look outside traditional Western medicine and begin a life-changing journey to understand nutrition. Bobby was grieving the loss of her sister to cancer. Her father was in the throes of heart disease and advancing dementia, and she was struggling with severe chronic fatigue. Her transformational journey to understand nutrition led Bobby to a plant-based, gluten-free, nutritional lifestyle that resulted in renewed energy far surpassing how Bobby had felt even 20 years earlier and inspired her to co-found with her older son a company called Read the Ingredients. I'm looking forward to talking with Bobby about her intense struggle with her relationship with food, why diets never work, how the foods we eat impact our health and our weight, how Bobby transformed her relationship with food from toxic to loving, and more for an enlightening interview that will highlight the ways people can take better, more loving care of themselves by releasing their toxic relationships with food. Hey, Bobby, a welcome, a warm welcome to Grief for Me Birth Podcast. And there is no way you come across as a, a low energy person anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's so great to have you here. <laughs> Thank you, Irene. And that was just awesome. I'll try to live up to all of that. that you just said. So it's thanks. all of who you are. <laughs> it's just amazing. <clears throat> so I, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan. <laughs> so Thank let's uh, help everyone get to know who you are by beginning with this question. Tell us about your early years, including how did you develop those severe eating disorders and explain the distorted reality about your body that those eating disorders represented. I am sure so many people listening to this are identifying with all that you're going to say. So go ahead. So I will start with the early years. I, I now know when we're young, we don't know the label to put on things, but I now know that I uh, grew up in a very dysfunctional home. I, I uh, my My biological mother was a pretty severe diagnosed schizophrenic. Oh my. Um, my father was, uh, um, my father was absolutely a narcissist. Um, and so basically grew up in a home where there really was not, not a lot of love, not a lot of support. Um, we were left to, fend, my sister and I were left to fend for ourselves. My father divorced our mother, uh, and got custody of us and remarried my stepmother uh, along came two additional siblings with her. So, and it was in very adversarial relationship and there was trauma. Which was the adversarial relationship with your father, with you? Everybody. He Everybody. encouraged adversarial relationships among the siblings. Um, his relationship with the stepmother was horrendous. Uh, she physically abused me. I was the uh, uh, one that took the wrath of. You were the scapegoat. Yeah, it, it was. It was. It, if you know, there there are things that I have read that say, okay, there's a checklist of ten things. If you've experienced uh, more than two of those in your childhood, then you, you know you've been severely traumatized. Well, I think on that list there were six or seven that that uh, that occurred in our household. So. 
So when I learned, uh, what, what again, a lot of this is in retrospect, what I now know, but what I know is that, um, you know, we need to find a way to numb ourselves when there's that much trauma around and food became my thing. And I, I also then on top of that, you get into the teen years when you're so influenced, especially as a female, when you are so influenced that you have to be thin, you have to look like this. And I happen to have the misfortune that my natural build is, is I was very tall, large boned. My sister, on the other hand, who was a year and a half older than I was, was very petite and, um, you know, and, and just always had that look, you know, that special look. She And she was very vain and she became um, enamored with makeup and clothes and all that at a young age. And there I was feeling very unattractive um, and large. And, and I wasn't, I mean, I know that I was not heavy. I was very active. So I managed to metabolize my poor decisions with food, <clears throat> but it, you know, all of this, whatever our addiction is, whatever the substance we abuse is uh, to numb ourselves, it's not, it's, it, we're, we're oblivious to what's happening uh, around it when it's happening. And so my thing happened to have been food. Um, and then my thing, my obsession with being thin and thinner and thinner took over. And by 19, I was in the full throes of an eating disorder. It started out as anorexia. I did not eat. Um, I just found a way to not eat. Um, a head of iceberg lettuce might be the thing that goes into my body for two days. And, and wow. that's it. Uh, lots of diet soda. I was a diet soda addict since I was 16 because I thought there's the answer. You can feel full. You can feel like you're treating yourself, not a single calorie. Um, I, I was on, uh, for many, many years, I would do at least, oh, a six pack plus of diet soda every day. And that's what I lived on for a couple of years. And then that progressed to be um, uh, bulimia because you can only survive so long on that. Um, I, 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 you know, I look back, I have, I own one picture from uh, after post two years post anorexia and, you know, nobody, nobody said to me, you have a problem, but I look at that picture. And if I see anyone that looks like that, they have a problem. You know that. You know what I, I, the thing is that, that um, I don't think a lot of people identify that food is an addiction, that food can be an addiction. They think about all, they think about drugs as being addictions or cigarettes as being addictions, but you see certain people and you say, oh my goodness. And that, and they're using food as an alcohol as an addiction, but they're using food as an addiction. Well, food and and it's the the it's the numbing. It's the how do we choose to numb ourselves? Mm -hmm. And you know, when I was when I was struggling with this, I would always say, "Why can't I be an alcoholic? That would be so much easier because you can give up alcohol. Why can't I be a drug addict? You can walk away from drugs, but when you're a food addict and food is your drug." You can't take food out of your life. I mean, I found that out for the two years that I tried. And uh, and so, you know, what do you, I mean, I would beg and plead. I would say prayers, please just let me be thin. Please let me stop being driven to eat. And um, and then it progressed to very severe for a good, I would say, 14 years, very severe bulimia where I would binge and purge. I would eat a tremendous amount of food to put myself in pain in a day. I would purge. I would starve myself for the next three days. And it was never healthy food. It was always junk. You know, oh, this is my chance to eat. It's chocolate cake. It's, you know, it's things that I would not normally, uh, that don't, you can't be sustained did you, on. Did you get very sick, Bobby? You know, amazingly enough, no. Um, I mean, I had, no, I had a normal amount of whether it's colds. I was hospitalized with meningitis at one point. I was, you know, I, <clears throat> more than anything, 
The other problem when you have eating disorders and it's a body image problem that doesn't come up when you are numbing yourself with other substances is that uh, you exercise neurotically. I mean, you are obsessed with exercising because you also believe that any single calorie you consume, you better burn off right away. And so I was so fatigued. So any sickness that I got meningitis being one was from complete fatigue. You know, I, I, so that was a way that that was a symptom and that was a sickness because yeah, you were, you were drained. You were, you were exhausting all your resources in there. Exactly. So let me ask you, so you're talking about your sister and I'm wondering about your relationship with her since you were so different. And then you became her primary caregiver in the last year of her life. So you want to talk about your relationship with her before she became ill. I know you healed a relationship with her after she became ill. And how did this experience impact your lifestyle? So, so my sister and I, no, we, we never, ever had a good relationship. We went through periods of time in my late teen years and on where we literally did not speak for a year or two at a time. We just didn't. Um, we were very different. We wanted different things in life. We were, we had different, um, we had different levels of self-awareness. Let me put it that way. And my sister, um, she never had a family. She never had kids. Kids were wanting kids and becoming a mom drove me for so much of my life. That was like goal number one, become a parent, have a family. For me, becoming a parent meant I would have the family I never had. I that was, gave you a chance to heal and to change yes. what had happened to you. I had. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I always knew, you know, a lot of people say, oh, my God, I grew up in such a terrible household. Why would I ever bring children into the world to be like that? And mine was always, uh, you know, I was very, very aware of things going on at a, an exceptionally young age. And therefore, I remember a lot from a very young age, which my sister did not, not had none of that. She would call me when we were adults and say, what happened when so-and-so? And And I could tell her as if I just watched it on TV in a, in a movie the night before. Mm. And, um, but I always said to myself, I can be the parent. I, all I have to do is not do all these things that I recognize you're doing that are horrible. And I can be a good parent. And I will tell you today, one of my absolute highlights of my life is I have three sons. I have a great relationship with every one of them. They're all adults. They're all married. I have seven grandchildren and I have, and I am part of the family I had always wanted. And if I accomplished nothing else in life, that was my number one goal. And I am just so just excited that, you know, that's how it is. You're the one in your family who changed the legacy. I did. I'm the one in my family who changed the legacy also. I did. And like some people, I think a lot of people are guided to repeat the legacy that they that they get. And others of us make other choices and we want to yeah. change that legacy. And it's to me in in the, in this day and age, I call it being conscious. Yes. That you're really aware of what's going on. So what happened with your sister when she became ill that you healed your relationship? Well, with so so the thing you need to know is. I never gave up being the good girl. Like I always felt like I need to do the right thing. And uh, so during um, our adult lives, prior to her getting sick, there were times she needed money. I loaned her money. It didn't get paid back. I, you know, I would fly to Florida. I lived in California. She lived in Florida. I would fly to Florida uh, if she needed me to be there for X, Y, and Z. And, and, uh, you know, but there was no reciprocating. I mean, it was, she was a very self-centered, all about her kind of person. And so when she got sick, it started out as this is the right thing to do. Um, Cause she had been sick it, from the time she was diagnosed until she died was a total of five years. Uh, so was I cancer? started, was it, was it cancer, Bobby? It was ovarian cancer. Yeah. And, uh, and so I, um, from the time she got sick, I was there for her, even though our relationship was really horrible. Um, I resented uh, how she treat, how she behaved 
toward me, but that doesn't mean I can turn my back on her. She is my sister. The same thing happened when my stepmother died, when my father died. I'm going to be there for them. Uh, when my biological mother died, I'm going to be there. I became my biological mother's caretaker later in life and um, and legal guardian. And, and, you know, that's just what you're supposed to do. And I feel very good about it. I didn't go into doing things like that, nor do I today and say, well, what's in it for me? I just not that kind of person. And so with my sister, when she got sick, I I was, okay, what can I do for you? You know, I'll, I'll come to Florida. I did. I came, I was with her for some of her treatments, you know, but it was, she had um, other people, the first round she did, and then she went into remission. She was in remission for about a year. Um, and then when she was re-diagnosed, I knew it was the end. And she was, you know, the last year she was really not capable of, of taking care of herself. So I coordinated myself when, when I could be there, which was most of the time, or her best friend was there helping her out or, you know, all of these, uh, there were other people, but mostly I was the person. And I have to tell you that she finally, my sister had a funny thing. I have to put this into the story because this really was so interesting. First of all, I learned a lot, just like I learned a lot about how to be a parent by growing up with awful parents. I learned how to be a good person by watching some of the things that my sister did and doing the opposite. Well, one of the things that my sister always had was, and this affected us when we were very young in school, whoever was friends with her, it had to be dedicated and loyal to her. Does that remind you of anybody? I'm not sounds gonna like say. your father. Yes. But also yes. sounds like your father was a narcissist and sounds like you had two of them in your family. Exactly. At least two. Um, it, you're exactly right. But you had to be de dedicated and loyal to her. So so when I would spend time in Florida and her best friend who did help take care of her and they were um, unbelievably close, she didn't want me being friends with that friend. She didn't want that. She had a boyfriend for a while who was also a business partner for a while. And he and I got to know each other because he and I are both business people. And, and that, you know, we had to like, all of that had to be very secretive. Well, it got to a point where I was taking care of her a lot. And I knew that things had changed when she started bad mouthing her best friend to me. And, you know, and, and I, and she would say, when we knew it was her last several months, she would say, Bobby, just please promise you will be here when I die. And I said, of course I will be. I said, but so will Carmen, your best friend. And she said, I don't care if she's here or not. I want you to be here. And it was like, I had, you know, it was so sad to me that she feels that way. Um, on the other hand, I knew that she looked at me differently, finally, you know, like I was in her inner circle. And you ask how that changed me as a person. There were a lot of things about experiencing that that changed me. One was seeing that and seeing how sad and awful that was, that, you know, I didn't, I, I just... I started to really understand her insecurities run so deep that we couldn't have had a good relationship as siblings. Um, we were fighting for the non-existent love of parents that were incapable of loving, but she didn't realize that. And I did. So she thought parents weren't loving her because they were loving me. I was the second child. And I understood all of that. So there was a lot of learning about that that went on. The other thing um, that changed me deeply was that seeing her die, she was uh, in her early 50s when she died, seeing her die, and I was a year and a half younger, I realized life is short. You know, we always used to joke about her that she would spend money on herself. If she had it, she would spend it. If she had it, she would spend it. If she didn't have it, she'd go find a boyfriend that had money and she would spend his money. So she was always spending money. And we used to always worry, we being me or anyone I talked to about this, used to worry, what's going to happen when she gets older? It's no longer going to be about her looks and getting the next boyfriend. And she had had what? that mask of being perfect. 
perfectly coiffed, perfectly this. And when you exactly. get older, you get you, 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 you face a lot more of the real you. Right. And so we used to always say, and one of the things I was always driven by was financial security. You know, I didn't care if I was rich. I didn't need a lot of material things. But financial security when we were raising kids and the kids were young was critical. And now enough financial security that my husband and I will be fine, you know. And so and and she was completely opposite. She was all about material things. So we worried about that. And and I realized from that experience, it was like, oh, right. Life is short. She didn't need to plan for getting old. And what have I been depriving myself of because I'm so overly concerned about financial security? And one of the things is I had always, I've always been an animal lover. I had always wanted to learn to ride horses and have horses and things like that. So at 57 years old, I got my first horse. My sister had died. I realized that I have been holding off. Do, that was one of my bucket list items. And uh, and let me tell you, horses are expensive, um, you know, caring for them, having them, all of that. But we moved into a home and we built we built a home on a property where I can have horses. I got horses. I, they are now my passion. And I absolutely give my sister or my experience with my sister credit for allowing myself to have that and and being okay with it. But more importantly, I think she influenced in a different and more indirect way, my journey to nutritional health and feeling good about my body, what I look like, um, you know, that I need to do something. I really think that had such an influence on me realizing I need to do something about my food issues. I mean, I really, really had had it. You started, yeah. you started realizing that if you don't take care of yourself, what's going to be for you? Her right. life, that's not there. She went. And if you were given more years, what was that going to be Right. about? I right. had the same experience when Saul died. 58 yeah. years old next to me. I mean, I was like, okay, now I don't sweat small stuff anymore. I mean, it's right. It changed me because you, you, I experienced something so traumatic. Yeah. What am I worrying about this little stuff? It, you sort of get a sense, at least for me, it happened. You get a sense of what's really important Yes. in your life, yes. you know? So speaking of what's important, tell us about the psychology of eating and how social media impacts how we eat. And of course, I'm picking all of this up from your wonderful book, which we'll get to in a little while. But I'm sure a lot of our listeners are all yours. Really tell us about the psychology psychology of eating, Bobby. <laughs> yeah. So, <clears throat> so uh, there's two pieces. Well, let's, let's just talk about, yeah, the, the, the psychology of eating part. So we eat, we should be eating because we're hungry. We should be eating to sustain ourselves. But our society has created all kinds of other good reasons for us to eat, which are not good reasons at all. Every social, let's go to the simple ones. Every social activity, every celebratory moment has food in it and rarely healthy food. I mean, nobody goes to a birthday party and expects to have a salad with a candle in it uh, that they're going to blow out. So uh, that's part of what we've done socially. We put alcohol as, you know, is in every celebratory event. And, you know, for people that don't have control, whether it's control around alcohol or control around food or whatever, these are all very dangerous places to be. And we're almost in a society, well, if you can't drink and you're going to a party and everyone else is drinking, you know, how... You have to take a look at yourself and say, why? And what am I doing? All right. So that's the social aspect. Then there's the um, numbing part of why we use food. I'm bored. I'm angry. I'm upset. I'm happy. Every emotion is tied to food. I'm, I'm celebrating. Why are all these emotions tied to food? I mean, I can't explain it. But here comes the kicker. We are, we have developed our society to be that way, to be all about food, drink, whatever. 
And then the food companies have created foods that are addictive, that are physiologically addictive. So with that in mind, hold your thought. So that was a big problem for many years with cigarettes, right? Because they were engineered. This is what I heard. They were engineered to be addictive. So you're saying the same thing has happened with food to cause people to become addicted to certain foods and all or the concept of it. Absolutely. For example, people will ask me, well, at my age and and for most of the environments I'm in, people will say, how do you stay so thin? And the answer, I mean, I just answer, I said, you know, well, first of all, I'm very active. And second of all, I I eat a whole food plant-based diet pretty much. And um, I'm definitely committed to no animal products, but um, it's not that. It's the processed food that I have eliminated from my diet. And Would you define processed food for those who are listening to us? Of Bob? course. Of course. So processed food, techni- the technical definition is anything that is not a whole food product. So whole foods are anything that, you know, animal product or plant product that, that grows that is a whole thing. So nuts are, you know, plain nuts, not... But once you take that nut and you roast it and you put sugar on it and you put this on, then it becomes processed. We're doing processed things to it. Sugar in itself is a processed food. So refined sugar is a processed food. Okay, that's the technical definition. Now, when you take a food, so for example, the foods that my company read the ingredients make makes, we have almost exclusively whole food ingredients in our uh, super loaves. We have one ingredient that is a processed ingredient. However, the processing of it, and that is protein powder, it's hemp protein powder. However, the processing of it does not compromise because we're not adding anything to it. But what we're doing is we're grinding it. What they do to get protein powder is they grind up, in our case, the heart of the hemp seed and and it becomes, but that's not what we're talking about when we talk about processed food. When we're talking about processed food, our super loaves do not have added sugar, do not have added sweeteners of any kind, whether it be stevia or whatever. So there's no added sugar, it's unsweetened. There's no added um, preservatives or anything to make them shelf stable. So they are stored in your freezer. Um, there is no uh, flavor enhancers. There's no, and here's one that's going to surprise everybody. When you see natural flavors in the ingredients, mm -mm -mm -mm. that is something that they've taken. Maybe the essence of let's take cherry soda. They've taken the essence of cherries, but then they do all kinds of chemical things with it, that it now becomes a chemical, not so natural, ingredient or not that healthy natural ingredient that we're all looking for. And you become addicted to the taste of that food. So you become addicted to some of those substances. Yes. And they completely change your metabolism and they completely change your microbiome, which is what goes on in your gut, which has everything to do with how you digest food, as well as your immune system, as well as the cravings in your brain. So people go, okay, well, I crave sugar all the time. And sugar was chocolate in particular, and sugar were my thing, mostly um, chocolate, I just normal candy. Dark and chocolate for me. It's not chocolate? Dark chocolate. Oh, dark chocolate. Well, now I eat dark chocolate fairly frequently, but I've never felt an addicted urge to eat it. But I used to eat milk chocolate. And um, my go-to when I was upset or I was ordering dessert in a restaurant or I was going to be chocolate, it's going to be chocolate cake, it's going to be chocolate ice cream, it's going to be chocolate. So that addiction that you feel to that sugar, that drive for that sugar, actually, believe it or not, happens in your microbiome. So things get all screwed up down there and it screws up everything. And it screws, it messes with your mood, it messes with your addictions, it messes with your immune system, and it messes with all of your digestive tract and how you digest food. So, so you're walking around the planet saying, I don't feel well, but you're not understanding that you're actually doing that to yourself every day. And you're saying to everybody who says, oh, you look great. Hmm. You've given up all these things that you love. I could never give up. I can't tell you how many times I hear that. I could never give up, fill in the blank, chocolate cheese, uh, milk, uh, potato chips, 
all of these things, what you don't realize is you may not have an eating disorder, but you are addicted to these things because they're made for you to want more. You can't eat just one was the famous the famous tagline for potato chips. They made it so you can't eat just one. Now, we all know if you don't start and eat one, you don't crave it. Or if you go for some length of time without that, you're not going to crave it. But if you are constantly eating them, yes, eating one is just going to spark that you must eat more. So that is... That, that is the, the food addiction, the emotional part that we don't understand when we say, oh, I could never give up. Well, no, you could give it up. And that's the point of what I learned like by being on this journey. Yeah. So, Bobby, I want to ask you, is that why diets don't work? Because they've got these addictions to food and then they're being asked to give it all up and they're not in touch with their problem that it is an addiction? Yeah, so so it, so that so the answer to that question is goes back to both the psychology of eating as well as the addiction part. So let me break that diet question down. So when we approach a diet, we think we're only doing this for a set period of time so that we can lose weight. Well, there's two flaws there. First of all, we can do anything for a set period of time. If it feels restrictive, if it feels punitive, we can do it for some period of time. But sustaining that is like if you want to get into shape, you're not going to get into shape by running for one month and then miraculously be in shape after that. But we don't approach diets that way. We approach diets thinking if I do this for six weeks or eight weeks, I'll lose the weight I want. And then I go back to normal life. So we tell ourselves we only have to deprive ourselves. So now we have two issues at play. One is the feeling that we're punishing ourselves. That has nothing to do with the food itself. That has to do with we've agreed, we've signed a contract with ourselves that we are going to punish ourselves and deprive ourselves for, let's say, eight weeks. And then I'll feel so good putting on that dress or that bathing suit and I'm all good. Then I can go to the to the beach and have my margaritas. Okay, there you go. Um, That's the Facebook picture that comes on. There you go. Here I am. That's right. That's right. And it's all about how they look. So that's problem number one. Problem number and, and the and the problem one A with that is that you're doing it for the wrong reason. You're doing it to look good, not to feel good. You have never even thought about, oh, I need to put my bathing suit on. Maybe I should get healthy. Nobody says that. They say, I need to put my bathing suit on. I need to get thin. And people do not understand that we have tied thin when we're young, especially thin and healthy are the same. And they're not. So that's number one. Number two, when we're all celebrating that we finally lost the weight we want to lose at the end of the two months, what do we do? We go and celebrate. We have that dessert with our dinner. We have Now I can. Now I can, right? Right. Right. I did all this so that I could go to that party or I could go to my high school reunion or I could do whatever. And now I'm here. And you've opened the floodgates because you've never had the thinking of, oh, I've stopped eating X, Y, and Z. Maybe I should not go back to X, Y, and Z. So, you know, as long as we think of diets as punishment or deprivation or restricting something that we want so badly, it's never going to work. It's never going to work. So it's more like you need to adopt a healthy lifestyle period Yes. that sustains you in your life. And that yes. may be giving up certain foods or certain yes. ways that you've been. So here comes another question that I've heard a lot, and I have a feeling you're going to debunk it. Is it true that as we age, it is normal to accept that our weight is going to go up and our energy level is going to go down? And if you look at a lot of aging people, that's what's happening to them. Yes. What is that about, Bobby? 
In one word, I would say it's resignation. I think something that happens when we get older is a lot of resignation. A lot of people think, I used to, I shouldn't say this publicly, but I used to say- Oh, but do on this public, on this podcast, <laughs> please do. <laughs> I think I'll change the names to protect you. My <laughs> husband and I often have the conversation of, oh, they're another one that's waiting for middle age, or they're another one that's waiting for old age. Um, and, you know, I recognize there are people that just go, oh, well, this is normal for 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 my age. And, and it's not, why do we think we're done living? Like we use that word retirement. People retire from work, but they also retire from living when they get to a certain age. And for everybody, that age is different. Um, aging is such a funny thing because look at you and me. We're not, we're not, we're I mean, does it ever, do you ever wake up, Irene, and go, oh, at my age, you know, I, it's amazing that I can do this. Whereas, no, what we say is, of course, we're doing this. And okay, the calendar says we're this age. And I think most people are resigned. So if you've been living your whole life carrying extra weight, you become resigned to it. And if you live your whole life being what I'll call without judgment, no, I'll use a different word because I don't want it to sound judgmental. If you have been kind of physically complacent in your life, you're certainly, it would be a rare person that would suddenly start exercise. We do hear about it, but start exercising at, at age 50. You know, that's not the norm. Now, that's what happens with our body is we get slower and slower and slower of what we do, what we need to do. We're not out running around as much when we're older. And yes, your metabolism is going to slow down and the weight is going to go on. But it didn't happen because you're older. It happened because you slowed down. Because would, you say, would you say getting older in, in any situation in life is more of a mindset? Because I would say in your situation and my situation, our mindset is not, okay, I'm going to get older and decay and do all of this. I'm, I mean, my mindset is I'm going to embrace life and do everything I can to stay as vibrant and healthy as I can, as opposed to, I see a lot of people who are really resigned. I'm getting older. I'm going to get sick. I'm going to die. This is inevitable. Oh, well, what are you going to do? Would, would you say it is a mindset? It's I, I'm absolutely, I absolutely 100% agree with that. It's like, so, so I, I don't like, I, res, I behave in my life based on how I feel. So a quick story. So I told you I got into horses and I have um, my wonderful horses. So I have a mare and I decided I had a mare and a gelding. I said, so I had on my, uh, that I owned and my gelding had to be put down. Um, he was suffering terribly and he had to be put down. And uh, I, I knew before he was, I knew we were progressing and I will not have just a single horse. Horses are not good when they're by themselves. They need to be part of at least two, a part of a herd. And, uh, and I was just, really concerned because finding someone else's horse that was trained properly, treated properly, that's what happened with the gelding that I had. And I so fell in love with him, but I got someone else's problems and I had to train this horse and work with him. I made him amazing. What I didn't know when I got him is he had old injuries and um, and, and they caught up with him. So so I thought, oh God, I can't go finding another horse um, to keep my mare company. So I got this brilliant idea that I'm going to breed her and have my own horse to train and not do someone else's mistakes and she'll be great and I'll have a great time doing it. So I did do that and uh, I had, I, I bred her 
And what I didn't, she's not even quite two yet, the little filly that she, that, that I now have. I was there when she was born. I feel like she's my daughter. I mean, this is an amazing experience. However, <laughs> the other day or recently I did the math. I mean, I don't even have, you know, I, I'm not putting a saddle on her until she's three or four years old. I am starting to train her and I'm working with her and I'm having a blast with her and she's amazing. But I thought, oh, my goodness, she's going to be in the prime of her riding years when I'm in my 80s. And I thought, what did I why didn't I do that math before I decided to breed this baby? Because the idea of me not having these two horses here on my property that I get to see every day and be with every day is like, oh, my goodness, what am I going to do? You know, so so there are times I laugh at myself because I'm in such denial about where I am in my life as far as my age. And, you know, I do some crazy things. I still ski very aggressively. I play hours of pickleball during the week. I, you know, you can't slow me down. I'm working. Good for I'm you. Books. Good for I'm you. Good for you. Things. Yeah. But sometimes I got to stop and think, oh, yeah, my horse will be in the prime of her life when, you know, I might be too old to ride her. So, yeah. So it's it's an interesting concept, this whole thing about age. But, yes, it is a mindset. And 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 yes, we should be responsible to know that, yes, you need more protein when you're older. And yes, you need to listen to your body and things like that. But at the end of the day. I will never be resigned to, oh, I can't do that because of my age. I mean, you just, you can't be like that. And not only that, I think that in, in your 80s, you'll still be writing her. And, I might be. And, and certainly if you're not or can't do it as much, you'll have a lot of loving people around you who will be very happy to entertain you and give you joy as you watch them writing her. Yes, no question. Yeah. No question. So let me ask you also, it's obvious that your journey to change your relationship with food from toxic to loving impacted your relationship with yourself. We're sort of hearing that the horses are a symbol of that. And we've talked about your life changing journey to understand nutrition and explain how foods we we eat impact our health and our weight. So I want to go forward with that to ask you about your motivation to write freedom from a toxic relationship with food a journey that will give you your life back. And who did you write this book for? So you really packed a lot in that question. Can I ask you to ask me the second part of that, the book part of that? I want to go back and, want to, and address what you said in the beginning of that question, which is the change in the relationship with myself. I think- Yeah, so I said, how did your journey to change your relationship with food from toxic to loving impact your relationship with yourself? Yeah, so- so. I have to tell you, I mean, this is huge. And I really think your listeners will really, really hopefully be able to embrace this. So I spent my life feeling very accomplished, actually, very accomplished. I mean, I've been an entrepreneur. I've started companies that have all been very successful. Um, I had written a book 20 years ago that was a success and that applied to my business back then. You know, I, I checked, I had the family I wanted, my relationship with all of my sons was always outstanding. And, uh, you know, I looked at my life and said, I am so accomplished. Why can't I get a handle on this one area, the area of food and the area of feeling like I, you know, like I looked good or that I felt good physically, had the energy I wanted um, you know, I beat myself up over that and cracking the code in changing my relationship with food. So it, you know, I was very conscious that this is not about I'm at a certain weight that I'm happier or that I, you know, that I have the energy that I want. It was actually identifying that it was a relationship with food that was holding me back. It was not putting food in the right place in my life that was holding me back. And I beat myself up over it. For my younger years, it was if I could just lose 10 pounds, I'll be happy. But it became so much more about who I am as a person and how I get to be you know, in control of my destiny. And so, yes, it completely uh, changed my relationship with me because 
No. Do I feel like I can do anything? No, it's not about that. It's about believing that I can have what's important to me, believing that I can. Um, Another thing I have to tell you is that one of the other changes that were made when I got a hand on all this is my relationship with everybody, um, including my marriage. I will tell you, it is a, I live in a different world now than I lived in 20 years ago. Uh, in my relationships with people. I have so much more compassion for other people. It's not about the bad mood that what I ate last night does to me and that I get grumpy with my husband or that, you know, I I, I get short tempered with somebody. No, I am I, I am truly a different person. Like if if this is a, a, a you know, a flat mood and this is happy and this is negative emotion, I lived too much of my life below the line before. I live so much of my life above the line now. I mean, it takes something pretty important to get me below the line. And uh, pretty- Change your perspective on your life. Change your perspective about everything. Yes, yes. So, So I believe in me. And by believing in me, I can feel so much better about the people around me. I mean, it just- the people that are important to me are even more important to me than they ever were before. So, yeah. So well, you, I, you went yeah. through such a struggle to be you. So I think that you, to, to be all of who you are, there yeah. was that piece that was missing. So now when you meet people, at least this is this way for me, when I meet people who, who have issues or problems, I was there. I experienced that maybe not the same exact thing, but a shade of it one way or the other. So I have compassion for for them on their path. It's not that I'm better. I pray for them that they find their way on their path to also live a better life for themselves. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Now for your question about the book. Who did I write the book for? So as I say, and I know you read this in the book. So as I say in the book, when I was in the worst throes of bulimia and, uh, um, well, bulimia um, for all those years and and horrible eating habits, I, I looked everywhere for a solution. I mean, I looked everywhere. As I said, I'm a very driven, very accomplished person. I just was not willing to believe I can't fix this problem. And yet for many, 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 too many decades, I couldn't fix the problem. Um, but I had always promised there was something in me that always said, I don't believe I'll ever be cured. But if I am ever cured, I am going to pay it forward. I just have to pay it forward. This was a struggle in my life. It was secretive. It was shameful. It was so many things not good that held me back just in, in, as you said, how I felt about myself um, that I knew if I ever did figure it out, I was going to pay it forward. Nobody should have to struggle the way I struggled. And um, and the book was was a big part of how do I share this? How do I get this out there? Um, and uh, the food company was another because uh, one of the things that I say in the book is if you are going to change your relationship with food and eat healthfully and feel good about it, you have to have healthy food available to you all the time so that you're not going to go eat that one more potato chip and uh, and get hooked again or get, you know, or destroy your body and destroy your mood. So so the my company and the book were written for and I'm you know, I love this. So I have to tell you, this is just so heartwarming. Just recently. I don't remember where. She got wind of the book, but recently uh, a woman read the book. I had no idea who she was. She was, oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. It happened in reverse. The woman was a customer uh, of our for our products, and she was a subscriber. A lot of people, once they try our product, if they are super clean eaters, they subscribe, like they get a subscription. So this woman bought, converted to a subscription, and about six months in canceled her subscription. 
And usually uh, people tell us why, because they get a questionnaire when they cancel. Well, she didn't see where on our website she could cancel. So she actually sent an email to our company and said, um, please cancel my subscription. So I wrote back to her and I said, absolutely no problem, but I would like to know why if you don't mind. And she said something to the effect of, well, I know how, she said to me, I know how healthy they are and they're delicious and I've loved eating them. She goes, but I'm going into a new food program where I have to be very specific about what I eat and I have to measure what I eat. Well, bells and whistles went off in my head. She's going to do a diet. Right. It's going to be, you know, so I couldn't help myself. I reached out to her for my personal email and I said, um, I, I'm sorry if I'm being too forward and intrusive and you can certainly tell me and you don't even need to respond to this, but is this for weight, what you feel are weight issues that you want to address? I said, um, I just want to bring to your attention that I really can relate. I've written this book. I want you to, um, you know, reach out to me and tell me if you want to. Um, you know, do you want to talk? Do you want to look? She she uh, bought the book and wrote back to me and said, like before she even received the book, she said, oh, my God, like, you know me, you know, no, I don't, you know. And so she and I now are in constant communication. Yes, it is a weight issue. Yes. She read my book. She loved the book. She is she even got a therapist to help her through this. She has tried plant based eating over and over and over again. And then she falls off the wagon and she has a considerable amount of weight that she wants to lose. But when we started talking about it in terms of her health and not her weight, it became a, a real conversation. So now light goes an, off. Yeah. And I have an ongoing relationship. We did a Zoom call. So we both know who each other is. And yeah. And to me, if that was the only person that my book impacted, mission accomplished. That's beautiful. So, I mean, you're talking about the benefits that come to a person from a new, loving, healthy relationship with food, which is really a new, loving, healthy relationship with their bodies and themselves, right? So what else would you like to share about your book for everyone who now would love to buy it because they need to be inspired? Uh, what else would you like to tell everyone about so, freedom from a toxic relationship with food? Yeah. So I think um, I, I think what's important to know is I wrote the voice of this book is a voice of support and compassion. So there's a bazillion books out there that will tell you how to eat to be healthy or how to eat to be thin or how to eat, you know, tell you about nutrition or tell you about how important fiber is. You can find a bazillion books. Some of them are great. Some of them I learned what I now know from. But I never found a book that told me, that explained what's happening and also uh, written from a voice of support and compassion and somebody I could relate to. So I do spell out my personal story in there because I want you to know I've walked in your shoes. I understand. And then I give <clears throat> a lot of information at a superficial level, because there's no use me reinventing the wheel and telling you about nutrition and how things work in your body so much. But it really is how I did the journey that was very successful. And I take you through step by step. But more importantly, the voice in the book is I take you step by step holding your hand. And I encourage you, I encourage the reader many places in the book to please reach out to me. I want to be here with you, for you. Take the journey, take your journey with you that works for you. And um, and and I don't think that book existed. If it did, I couldn't find it. And that's what motivated me to write the book. So you're not going to get shamed. You're not going to get uh, a lecture in science and, and, and you know, necessarily. And, um, or, and you're not going to be taken on another diet. You're going to no, be educated exactly. and you're going to, and you're going to, it's a life to fall in love with yourself and love yourself and take better care of yourself. And Bobby's your guide. Yes. 
And it's, and, and as you said, it's a lifestyle. It is not a diet. It is a lifestyle. And I don't go anywhere now where I compromise what works for me. I mean, I just got back from Mexico to eat whole food, plant-based, gluten-free. I had a blast. And did I have a drink here? Did I have a couple of margaritas? You betcha. Do I ever drink anywhere else? No, because I don't care for, I don't like anything about drinking except when I'm in Mexico with my husband. So, you, you know, go. you can do all that. You can live a good life, but be true to yourself and be true, being true to yourself means taking good care of yourself and how we use food impacts that every minute of your day. I really believe, I need to say this, I really believe everything we put in our mouth Everything we eat is either going to improve our quality of life or detract from it. And it's our choice to make. So let me ask you before I, I have another, I want to ask you about your company with your, with your son, Michael. But before I ask that, what is with the gluten-free thing? Because I'm gluten-free also. I have an allergy to wheat. But why did you become gluten-free? So I, it's just easier for me when I tell people I'm gluten-free. I'm not really allergic to the gluten. I'm right. allergic to wheat. So what What that did you, what a lot of people are becoming gluten-free these days. Yeah. So what is all that about, Bobby? So, so there are some people that feel like there are doctors, there are professionals, some, not many, who will tell you we should all minimize our intake of gluten or specifically wheat. There are multiple grains that have gluten in them. But anyway, um, so for me, it was a, a an experiment. It was an experiment. It was trial and error of uh, when I was figuring, you know, when I was on this journey and I was figuring out what I can and can't, what works for my body. Um, I, uh, I had just... I had really eliminated gluten almost by accident for periods of time. Um, because as I tell in the book, my husband was not, my husband's always been the food person in the family. He's done all the cooking, raising the kids. Thank God. Cause I was petrified of food. He's done all the grocery shopping. He's a dream come true. <laughs> you would think, except that it was food that I now know wasn't always doing me great. Although it was not, it was, you know, it was not processed food. Um, so he really was an amazing cook. As a result, all three of my married sons are the cook in their family, which I just, I'm very proud of that. Anyway, so um, my husband, for the last eight years that he worked, he worked far away. So he was only home on weekends. So during the week, I would eat a salad for dinner. Like every night was a salad for dinner. I didn't have the pasta. I didn't have the bread. He comes from a French family. So it's all, they eat bread, you know, baguettes with every, with every meal. Um, I wasn't eating any of that. And I would realize at the end of the weekend, I was so bloated and cramping and, and felt terrible that I said, huh, I wonder if, and I started to eliminate the bread and the pasta completely. And oh my God, I mean, it made a huge difference. So for me, I found out by accident that I really am gluten intolerant. Now I will also tell you, Recently, we got a pizza oven and Sunday is pizza night here. And I used to make my own gluten-free crust and he would make his regular crust. Well, he loves to play around in the kitchen. So he found out and he wasn't the pizza lover that I used to be. I used to be fanatic about pizza with all, more cheese than you could handle and all of that. So he uh, figured out the recipe for incredible pizza crust. I'm also from the East Coast. So I know New York, good New York pizza and things like that. And uh, he found out that he gets heritage wheat from Italy. He actually gets imported wheat and imported uh, yeast. And he makes his own pizza crust. So I tried it. And guess what? I can eat it. I wow. can do that with no problem. So yes, we do something terrible to our grains here, um, whether it's the the you know the genetic modification that we do, whether but even organic here, I would not even attempt. And um, and I can eat his pizza crust. So and That's when we were in Mexico, they make pizza. They use heritage wheat, and and I could have some pizza down there and to no detriment. So yeah, gluten is problem for some people, but also the way we grow our grains. Is I think it's the way for me. I think I formed an allergy to wheat and yeah. uh, I, I had a definite physical symptom 
yeah. that was happening to me. I went to an allergist, it didn't show up. I went to a natural path and it showed up. So, yeah. uh, you know, so, and I do feel terrific and people will say gluten-free, you know, well, guess what? I'm doing great gluten-free. Well, and the one thing I want to it's wheat free, actually, not gluten free, yes. but that's yeah. But the one thing, and I do, I react, I definitely have shown an intolerance to wheat in those allergy tests. So about gluten free. So yes, it's become a fad. And it, that's very sad, I think, because the reason it's sad is not that it's bad, you know, it's a horrible thing if people give up gluten. But what the big food companies have done is they've put other crap into food that you know, makes up for the lack of gluten, gluten holds it together. So wheat is a grain that will hold everything together. If you make like when I was making a gluten-free pizza crust, I have to put other things in there. Um, It turns out what really works well is, is chia seeds and flax seeds also are a binder. And so you can put those in there and, you know, but but companies don't do that. What do companies do? They put all kinds of really bad oils and fatty things as an emulsifier or as to bind the the uh, non glutinous uh, flours together. And you know it's bad for you. So people go, oh, I'm gluten free. I'm healthy. Well, not necessarily. Most of the gluten free breads that you're going to buy in the store have more crap in them than your regular organic wheat breads. And um, yeah, so you you mentioned, I'm not going to say it on the podcast, but you mentioned a brand when we were talking before that you can no longer get of gluten-free bread. Mm-hmm. That bread does not have great ingredients. Oh, I wow, that's really good bread. to know. Yeah, most of, most of the commercially made gluten-free breads uh, are, not, are not healthy. They're just not healthy. They have a lot of crap. And when you go to gluten-free crackers and things like that, you're going to find a lot of the same thing. So I really encourage people to read the ingredients, which is exactly what we named our company. Right. So tell us about read the ingredients and what are your popular items and where can people purchase them? So we have one, we we have one item in four different flavors. It's called a super loaf. And what it is is it's a mini loaf shaped. Um, like a muffin, like what you would call a muffin, but it's mini loaf shaped and it is made with 100% whole food ingredients. It is gluten-free, it is vegan. And um, we sell them on our website online. Um, They are fabulous. They are made to be an entire breakfast or lunch meal. So calorically, they're between 305 and 370 calories for a single one, depending which flavor you have but it doesn't have added sugar. It doesn't have added sweeteners. You're not going to be hungry two hours later. You're going to, it's going to satisfy you. I mean, I'll, I'll eat one for breakfast. That's all I have for breakfast that and my, and and with coffee. And I go out and play three hours of pickleball and I'm not, I am not famished at the end of that. Um, And, you know, because there's not a single wasted calorie, they're high in protein, they're high in fiber. They have very healthy carbs and fats, and um, it's all natural whole food ingredients. And the reason we made them is because when I started traveling after I was eating healthy, there is literally not an equally clean packaged product on the market. There just isn't. There is no packaged product on the market that is that I can eat. So when I'm running through airports, if I don't have my own food with me, there's nothing I can eat. So I made them for myself. And as people, I was sharing them with people, they were going, oh my God, we need to be able to get these. So we started the company. We had just sold the previous company that we were uh, partnered in, my son and I, and we started read the ingredients and we are available on our website, rtifoods.com or Amazon. Uh, just look up, read the ingredients, super loaves. Oh, that's great. And you talked about the spiritual side of who you are with your horses and with what you, how this new lifestyle change has led to your desire to be of service to others. Would you like to tell us a little more about that, Bobby? Yeah. You know, you're know, rebirthing yourself in a way you're, you're transforming. Yes, oh. absolutely. there is no question about that. And, you know, it, it comes at a time when 
you know, when I've experienced the loss of people that um, actually many outside of my family who I was very close with, as well as the introduction of my grandchildren. So I now have seven grandchildren and, you know, it does feel like a rebirthing, but yeah. What I, so what I talk about in the book is this about my becoming completely vegan and completely supporting animal rights, animal welfare, um, and the impact on our planet of, of our lifestyle, the way it is. I would have, I spent, you know, almost 60 years of my life, absolutely knowing that I love animals and not making the connection between my love of my pets, whichever many of my pets we're talking about, and the rest of the animal population and the rest of the world. And I have become, unfortunately, unfortunately exposed to and educated about how horrendous we treat farm animals. Uh, we treat even horses that are out in the wild. We, you know, we as human beings are not very humane or compassionate when it comes to how we treat animals. And to me, it is heartbreaking. However, prior to this, what you call rebirthing, I could put my head in the sand and I can't anymore. I can't about people. I can't about the planet, and I certainly can't about animals. I just can't. This planet and my privilege of spending this time on this planet, it's not mine. It's not mine to destroy. It's my privilege to have been here. And I need to be aware and want to leave it a better place for those grandchildren. I really, you know, that change, having grandchildren changed my perspective. That's right. And now you have the passion. And you have a legacy to leave to them. That's yeah. wonderful. So tell us, and this whole interview has touched on it. In your opinion, what is, why should people go out of their way to heal? Be it emotionally, be it from their food addictions, for instead of just accepting this is my life and this is the way it's going to go, why go to the trouble of healing your stuff, facing your issues and healing your stuff? The glib answer would be because we can, uh, but the more reasonable answer is, I look at it this way. We have X number of way too short years or very short years to live on this planet in this life form. Why not make it the best you can? Why not? That's great. And what is the Bobby tip for finding joy in life? What's the Bobby what? The Bobby tip for finding joy in life. What would you like? Oh. What 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 is your advice to everyone to find? I mean, because you can live life is filled with suffering, but you can also still have joy. Yeah. Just just look for the things around you to love, the things, the people, the animals. Look for that joy. And it's right there in front of you. Just look for it. It's right there in front of you. You have a bad moment, just look around you. It's not so bad. It's really not so bad. I believe everything that feels like a negative thing is really has a silver lining and is an opportunity just to live a better life. That's beautiful. Thank you, Bobby. That's beautiful. You know, your courageous journey to free yourself from your from your toxic relationship with food started with a thought. What we eat determines how we feel and how we perform in every aspect of life. Thank you for the great role model that you are for healing and transformation, not only about our relationships with food, but in so many other ways, and for writing your book that encourages your readers to get healthy by building a new exciting relationship with food and with themselves. And I want to thank you from my heart for sharing your important insights with our Grief and Rebirth podcast audience today. Irene, it has been such a pleasure for me. From the moment you and I met over a year ago, I, I have been in love with you and your energy. Thank you Thank so you. much for having me. Well, you just gave me a chill. Thank you so much. And I want to give everyone a loving reminder that you can see the show notes and all Grief and Rebirth podcast episodes on IreneWeinberg.com and make sure to follow us and like us on social at, at Irene S. Weinberg on Instagram, Facebook, 
wherever you get your social, your podcast, your social media, we're, we're there. And as I like to say, to be continued, many blessings and bye for now. Thank you so much, Bobby. Thank you. Wonderful.